today for our webinar on Keystone Retaining Wall Systems presented by Keystone. Before we start today's presentation, we would like to cover a few housekeeping matters that will ensure we have a smooth presentation. We have placed all phones on mute to cut down on background noise and to ensure everyone can hear the presentation. At the conclusion of today's webinar, we will provide information on how to obtain PDH certificates for today's presentation. The webinar is scheduled to last for one hour. We will have about 50 minutes of presentation followed by a question and answer period. When you logged into the webinar, the GoToWebinar window will have appeared on the upper right-hand corner of your screen. This window will minimize by itself after a few seconds so that it does not interfere with you viewing the webinar. If you would like to maximize this window, just click on the small red arrow and the window will be maximized. The blue box in the GoToWebinar window will allow you to minimize or maximize the presentation so you can view it in whatever size works best for you. If you have a question, please type your question into the chat box and we will be taking questions throughout the presentation. Presenting today will be Michael Bernardi of Tencate and Jill Fredericks of Keystone Retaining Walls. Michael is a geotechnical engineer who has been at the center of the segmental retaining wall industry since its beginning. Not only has Michael contributed to industry manuals, developed advanced design software, and innovative new products, he has also personally designed over 10 million square foot of retaining walls. Michael's technical guidance is highly sought after by industry experts. Bill Fredericks is a region manager for Keystone Retaining Wall Systems. He graduated from the University of Minnesota with a bachelor's degree in geological engineering. Upon graduation, he worked as a consultant for a geotechnical engineering firm until joining Keystone Retaining Wall Systems. His primary emphasis for the last six years has been transportation-related retaining wall systems and applications. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Michael. Uh, good day to all, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. Um, the theme of today's webinar, as Lisa stated, is the evolution of the modular block retaining walls. Um, as part of the evolution, the design approach and methodologies have also changed over the years. Um, over the next few minutes of this webinar presentation, I'll briefly go over the changes that have occurred in the last 25 years or so with the design of these structures. As the slide indicates, my presentation will, talk, will touch on the following topics. First, a brief and general comment on modular blocks and their use in retaining walls. Then, uh, the introduction of geosynthetics, and specifically soil reinforcement elements, and their effects on the modular block retaining wall systems. Then we'll look at the um, evolution of the design approach and the corresponding guidelines and codes. And then finally, uh, what is potentially in store for us uh, in the future. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, um, the term modular block retaining wall and segmental retaining wall will be used interchangeably. In the beginning, um, modular blocks were uh, created to replace or as a replacement to timber ties. Timber ties were a very popular way of, of creating um, landscape walls. Uh, in fact, I can remember when some of these modular blocks actually looked like uh, timber ties. Um, they were used primarily in landscape applications and they were uh, installed by uh, landscape, architect or landscape contractors or do-it-yourself homeowners and usually these walls were fairly short. The design, if there were any design, uh, were based on gravity uh, wall design approach. Uh, in the early 80s, uh, we saw the emergence of geosynthetics, again, specifically reinforcement elements uh, known to us as, as geogrids. By the late 1980s, geogrid reinforcement was being used in conjunction with concrete modular blocks. Um, this opened the door to the construction of higher walls, much higher walls. Uh, modular block retaining walls were becoming very popular in private commercial projects. Um, we saw the emergence of specialized contractors and installers. These systems provided stable structures that had a significant reduction in cost to the, um, when compared to the existing alternatives. 
from a design point of view, uh, we needed to develop methods and tools for the, for the engineering community to use. We had to develop methods that would take into account external, internal, and facing stability. Just as we did with other gravity structures, we needed to make sure that external stability was stat satisfied. Uh, the result of this analysis gave us the depth of that reinforced mass, or uh, the length of the reinforcement. We looked at um, base sliding as a mechanism uh, of uh, potential failure. We also looked at overturning, uh, but we know that overturning doesn't really uh, occur with uh, these types of walls. So rather, we uh, looked at the eccentricity of the resultant on the foundation. And finally, we looked at uh, bearing capacity to make sure that uh, the, the weight of the structure did not, uh, uh, was not greater than the bearing capacity of the soil. Um, we also needed to satisfy internal requirements. Um, what, internal re what internal analysis uh, produced was the type of reinforcement and the spacing of reinforcement. When I say type, I mean the weight, the lightweight or heavier weight. Uh, the mechanisms we looked at were pull-out. Uh, is the reinforcement long enough to provide anchorage in the passive zone? We looked at tensile overstress. Uh, is the reinforcement strong enough to resist the stresses? And we also had to look at internal sliding. Can the reinforcement resist sliding along its length? Uh, just for illustration, I, 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 uh, I show the equation here for the long-term design strength of the uh, reinforcing elements. Uh, as you can see, the long-term design strength is uh, equal to the ultimate strength of the reinforcement element divided by a whole bunch of these reduction factors. Uh, reduction factors were for creep, installation damage, and durability. Uh, similar equation exists for the pullout and the, uh, the internal sliding. Uh, finally, uh, we, uh, uh, the analysis requires that we ensure that the facing is stable. We need to make sure uh, that the reinforcement is placed high enough in the structure so that toppling of the upper, upper blocks is avoided. Also, we have to satisfy connection capacity um, along the full height of the structure. And, uh, and Joe will have something to say about that. And finally, we have to not analyze the potential for bulging, which is a function of the re reinforcement spacing and shear capacity between the blocks. And in today's um, analysis, we look at internal compound stability uh, to determine that potential. Uh, again, for illustrative, I threw up the, uh, the equation for the long-term connection strength. And you can see that it has the same, uh, the same configuration as the one for the uh, long-term design strength, where T con peak is the uh, is the short-term um, uh, test, the peak connection for the short-term test. And I, I refer to the short-term test because, um, which I'll show later, we, we also now look at the long-term test. Um, and there is the two reduction factors on, on the denominator for creep and, and durability. The NCMA assigns a value of 1.5 to, to uh, both uh, the, the product of the creep reduction factor and the durability reduction factor. Um, AASHTO, uh, which has uh, its own um, equation for the long-term uh, connection strength, uh, again, it is similar except for uh, the obvious uh, inclusion of the uh, uh, last term, which is uh, T ultimate over T lot, which is exclusively a property of the reinforcement. But the other uh, major difference is the reduction factor for creep, which is now based on um, a sustained load test. And as, if you notice, there is an ASDM uh, standard, uh, which has not been completed yet, and that's why there aren't any numbers there. 
so a different approach to the long-term uh, connection strength when looking at the uh, AASHTO code. So let's look at uh, the evolution of the design guidelines and codes. Uh, the first document to, to really address modular block retaining walls was developed by the uh, National Concrete Masonry Association, or the NCMA. The first edition was published in 1993. It was based on the allowable stress design uh, approach. And it, um, and it covered the external, internal, and facing analysis, as I just described. Um, four years later, uh, the second edition came out, um, pretty much exactly the same, except th this uh, manual or this guideline was, uh, in my opinion, a lot simpler. It took away uh, a lot of the more complicated ways of looking at things. And then finally, um, in 2009, uh, the third edition of the NCMA manual uh, was published. And it was, uh, it was, as far as I'm concerned, a refinement. It introduced the internal compound analysis. It uh, treated the top of wall geometry with more detail. It allowed the user to include vertical load components. And really, for the first time in, in, the, in the commercial market in any way, um, it provided uh, a section on roles and responsibilities. At this point, I should say that uh, the vast majority of retaining walls in the private commercial markets um, are designed using the NCMA method or some derivative of it. Um, a little, a quick word on the um, allowable stress design method. Essentially, in simple terms, it's, uh, we design these walls actually to fail or right at failure, and then we impose a factor of safety on it. So you have the resistance forces divided by the driving forces is equal to some factor of safety, which, as you can see in the slide, is different for different uh, failure mechanisms. Um, where the NCMA was used for the private commercial uh, market, the public and DOT markets uh, were um, we used the AASHTO, the American Association of Transportation and Highway Officials, code. Uh, and until um, about 2007, it was an allowable stress design approach. But since then, uh, we now look at the uh, load and resistance factor design. And what exactly is that? It's a complicated thing, but in simple terms, uh, two limit states are considered in the design, the ultimate limit states and the serviceability limit states. For the ultimate limit states, um, that is associated with the collapse or other similar forms of structural failure. And these states are achieved when the driving forces are greater than or equal to the resisting forces. So what we need to do is apply partial load factors, which are usually greater than one, and partial resistant factors, which is less than one. And next slide, I'll show you how this is applied. And also, we look at serviceability limit states, something that we, we don't do often enough. And this is associated with the deformation of structures. Uh, these states are attained if deformations uh, occurring within the design life exceed the uh, prescribed limits. And usually, the partial factors of safety are set to one. Now, what is the um, ultimate limit states um, approach? Well, as I said before, um, it is uh, where the resistance forces, the factored resistance forces, are equal to or greater than the, the factored driving forces. And you can see that the, the factor used in the resistance uh, forces side of the equation is usually less than one. And the, um, the factor for the driving uh, forces is usually greater than one. Um, another another uh, manual or design guideline that is out there is, the, is uh, published by the Federal Highways Administration. It also looks at external, internal, and facing analysis. And it follows very closely uh, the AASHTO design guideline. But it has uh, some uh, subtle differences. 
And most recently, um, the Federal Highway Administration has published an interim implement, implementation guide, which deals uh, really with the construction of bridge abutments. Um, it is uh, it is commonly known as the GRS IBS, the Geosynthetic Reinforced Soil Integrated Bridge System. And the, the major difference uh, with this type of structure is the uh, spacing of the reinforcement, which is limited to um, about 12 inches. So you're talking about a, a very closely spaced reinforcement mass. And finally, um, my last slide is uh, what's in the future. And um, we, uh, there are those who feel that the internal stability of, of uh, retaining structures can be defined um, or can be calculated using the limit equilibrium um, approach, which would give us a, a unified design approach for uh, both retaining walls and for slope stability. So uh, in the coming uh, years, we should uh, all be looking uh, at, at this development. And that brings us to our first uh, polling question. And I give it back to Elisa. Thank you, Michael. Um, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, we'd like to get your participation um, throughout the presentation with a few poll questions. The first one is, which market segments do you work in? OT county or municipal segment, commercial development, residential development, or an, another segment? Also, another reminder is we are taking questions throughout the presentation, so don't forget to log those into the chat box, and we will try to get to your answers at the end. If we don't get to all of them, we are able to uh, we plan on following up with you individually uh, to get those questions answered. I'll give you a few more seconds to uh, close till I close the poll. Okay, almost everyone has voted. We have 52% of the audience is in the DOT county or municipal segment. 28% is in the commercial development segment. 10% uh, is in residential development and 9% other. I'm going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to Joe. Okay. Uh, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're at in the U.S. Um, my name is Joe Fredericks, and I'm a regional manager for Keystone Retaining Wall Systems. Um, today, in this portion of the webinar, we are going to discuss the evolution of Keystone from a component and design perspective. Um, just a general introduction to Keystone and our parent company, Contact Engineered Solutions. Um, Contact is a total site solutions provider for commercial development, residential development, industrial development, and uh, highway DOT type of work. Uh, they have a wide range of project products from the Conspan bridges to the Keystone retaining walls, revetment systems, um, underground storage systems, and so on. Okay. As I mentioned in the previous slide, Keystone is a subsidiary of Contec. Um, Keystone is an intellectual property company. Um, Keystone invented the SRW products and licensed our model, which effectively brought SRWs to the market. Um, Keystone has been an industry leader for more than 28 years. Um, we have created and patented more than 180 retaining wall and paver products. Um, Keystone is continually recognized as the number one brand by industry professionals. This shows the very, very first year of Keystone. Um, the Keystone system was invented in 1985 by Paul Forsberg, who was a landscaper looking for a more efficient way to build a retaining wall versus the timber ties and so on that Mike had mentioned earlier. Um, the original Keystone units were wet cast as shown in this photo. Um, it was very quickly determined that a wet cast process would not be able to meet the demands um, of the Keystone retaining wall system. Uh, it also limited the ability to texture the face of the units, um, both of which have become very important nowadays. Um, through experimentation and extensive research, um, Paul was able to determine the most effective way to manufacture the Keystone system was through a dry cast masonry process. Um, this was the first of many innovations Keystone has brought to the segmental retaining wall industry. 
So going from that slide where you see Paul and a few of his um, employees wet casting products to today, we've grown significantly in that period of 28 years. Um, Keystone is a full service support um, company for retaining wall systems. Uh, Keystone has continually improved upon our systems and service by creating a full service engineering firm um, who are capable of providing a wide range of services from design software and estimating tools to complete construction shop drawings um, for specific products or projects. Um, we also have a sales and field support team for assistance in the selection of systems as well as the installation of those systems. Um, and the backbone of the uh, intellectual property side of Keystone is a research and development team which continually tries and improves existing systems and creates new solutions um, for the market. And to bring this all to the market, we have a marketing team that, which creates product and installation education materials um, to assist in the selection of um, different systems and also the installation of the many different Keystone systems. Keystone is a worldwide um, company within the U.S. Um, Keystone has licensed manufacturing locations um, in 60 different um, locations and more than 30 locations around um, the world outside of the U.S., ranging from Central America to Australia to Asia and Europe. Uh, this shows a little bit of the evolution of Keystone and how we've improved our products to uh, meet the demands of both design and construction. Um, the Keystone Standard Compact Unit have been through three major revisions. Um, the units pictured in this slide are the th um, three generations of the standard unit. These improvements were incorporated to maximize all three phases, the manufacturing, design, and installation efficiencies and performance of the Keystone retaining wall systems. This is the same evolution of the compact unit, um, which was the second um, structural unit uh, created by Keystone. I mean, as you can see in this set of photos and the previous photos of the standard unit, um, one of the major changes is the cores have been expanded and the pin receiving holes have been widened. Um, the tails of the units have also been widened to provide greater contact service for surface for um, vertically adjacent units, while still maintaining the ability to create um, radius is small as radius is as uh, small as five feet. Okay, I mentioned a few of the improvements in the previous slide, and I'll we'll go into a little bit more detail on what these improvements were and what the impacts were. Um, the wider pin receiving hole in the previous picture, um, the original compact had a somewhat of a kidney shaped pin receiving hole. Uh, in this case, we've lengthened that so we have more flexibility in the construction alignment process. Yeah. Um, probably the most important um, advance in the Keystone units is the alignment of the cores, the center core. Um, this allows very effective and easy filling of the cores with the drainage um, aggregates. And this also has an impact on the design and performance of the wall as well. Um, in the same process, through the um, refinement of the system, we were able to reduce the weight of the units. Well, not only maintaining, but significantly increasing the design performance of the units. Um, we have connection strength increases of 40 to 100 percent from the Compact 1 to the Compact 3 with the various different geogrids and geogrid strengths from each manufacturer. Okay, not only has the structural design of the Keystone units changed significantly um, over the last 28 years, um, the appearance and texture has changed to create the texture and appearance of a natural um, stone look. Um, the original keystone units were either a triplane or a straight face, as shown in the upper left and upper right corners. Um, the first change to this face was the creation of the Victorian stone in the lower right corner. Um, this was to mimic somewhat of a field stone appearance where we have smooth beveled edges and a rough um, rock face finish. Uh, for the rest of the face. Okay. Shortly after this unit was developed, uh, we began to experiment with a stamp face texture or a more of a hewn stone appearance. This is done through proprietary uh, technology where a stone texture is actually imprinted on the face of the, uh, the units. Around the same time, multi-piece unit um, systems were being developed such as our country manor or century wall system. These systems utilize a three to six piece system with varying widths of 4 to 18 inches, 
these multi-piece systems proved to be extremely popular from an aesthetic standpoint as they created a random stack stone uh, wall appearance. If these systems were less efficient in construction because of the number of unit sizes and also the size of the smaller pieces when considering larger structures. Um, this became a challenge when the random pieces, random piece systems were being used for large commercial walls with heights exceeding 30 to 40 feet. In order to provide the random stone appearance with the structural capabilities and construction efficiencies required for this height of a wall, we developed the random score face dial, which is shown in the lower left-hand corner. Um, this combined the design and construction benefits of the Compact 2 unit and the aesthetics of the multi-piece country manor or century wall uh, retaining system. This particular system creates the appearance of three different size units that are 7, 11, and 18 inches wide. The advantages of Keystone is it's really a, a universal facing unit, whether you're looking at the compact or the standard or the, the hewn stone or um, hard split, straight face, and so on. Um, one facing unit is used to construct the wall with the exception of 90 degree corner units or cap units. Um, the units can be easily modified or cut to um, allow site alignment changes without delays of casting specialty concrete pieces and so on. Yeah. The facing units are also field cut for pipe penetrations or other obstructions going through the face of the wall. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about that in a little bit. Yeah. Facing units can also be field cut for slip joints um, in excessive settlement situations. And one of the, the primary benefits, and we'll get into it more in the next slide when we talk about the keystone pins, but is the variability of batter that can be used with the keystone retaining wall systems. There's two different primary batters or pin placements. The first is a one horizontal and eight vertical, or it's basically one, an eighth, one and an eighth inch setback for eight inches of height, or an eighth inch setback for eight inches of height in the one and 64. And we can also achieve batter anywhere in between there by alternating on a vertically adjacent uh, rows which pin hole is used. So the one thing that hasn't changed in the Keystone history is the use of a Keystone fiberglass connection pin. Um, the pin allows for very quick and easy alignment for stacking the units that's very repeatable. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it provides various degrees of setback between the eighth inch and the one and the eighth inch. Okay. And we have a unit shear connector every 12 inches. And also as we get into the connection discussion that Mike had started previously, the, the pins contribute about 20% to the connection capacity, both short and long term, of the Keystone units. Um, the primary area, the area that that becomes the most important is in the construction of the wall when there is very little normal load on top of the, the grid layer because um, there is a certain amount of the connection that relies on friction. Um, the pins will locate and maintain the location of the geogrid during the construction process. It, these pins are also a structural component. They're non-corrosive, um, pull-treated fiberglass with a short beam shear strength of 6,400 PSI. As Mike had mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, um, geogrids began to be used with keystone walls in the late 1980s. Um, the first geogrids that were used with the keystone walls were high-density polyethylene geogrids. Um, these are somewhat of a, a, a stiff plastic type material, um, which are subject to high creep uh, values. Yeah. They're extruded and stretched, and they're highly dimensionally stable, and that's a positive and negative. Um, from a negative standpoint, they tend to uh, roll back up when they're being laid down. Quickly, we moved in probably in the mid to early 90s into more of a, a polyester geogrid. Um, these are typically high-strength uniaxial polyester geogrids versus a biaxial, and they're, even wo they're either woven or knitted and... Uh, coated with a PVC coating to provide both dimensional stability and also installation um, protection and UV protection. And they generally come in a, a wide range of, of strengths to create the most efficient um, layout of geogrid in a wall, um, whether it's a three-foot tall wall or a 60-foot tall wall. Um, there are grid strengths um, available for those different applications. Also in the mid-90s, we developed um, more of a, a high-performance system. It's our key steel soil reinforcement system. 
rather than using a, a polymer geogrid, this system utilizes a welded wire mesh galvanized steel ladder for soil reinforcement. Uh, the benefit of this is it greatly reduces any deflection that the wall may undergo due to active earth pressure rotation in this long-term creep. It's typically used for either very tall walls or walls that support very movement-sensitive structures. Um, and it was primarily developed for the uh, transportation um, market segment. Okay. Another very important component to the Keystone system is the drainage aggregate. Um, the drainage aggregate serves three key purposes. During the construction phase, the aggregate is placed in the unit cores into a depth of two feet from the front face of the wall. Um, this material requires very little compactive effort to achieve the required densities. Um, the second purpose of the aggregate is to increase the unit-to-unit -unit shear strength and the geogrid connection strength through um, granular interlock of the coarse um, crushed stone fill, typically of number 57 stone. Um, that's a little bit more tight than we use, but that's a similar type of material. Um, the granular interlock within the blocks for both block-to-block -block and geogrid connection is maximized with the open and through core design of the generation keys we discussed earlier. Um, the third purpose is to channel uh, input or water that's gotten into the system to the internal drainage system and out of the wall through drainage pipes. I'll talk a little bit about Keystone resources and some very general design information. Um, Keystone has developed several estimating and design tools and other resources useful in the selection, design, and construction of Keystone retaining systems. Um, we have a design program. We were pioneers in the industry um, in the development of this program back in the probably early to mid-90s. Uh, this program is available on our technical CD, which can be requested through our website at keystonewalls.com. Uh, also in the technical CD, we have a 35-page section of technical notes, which are one-page summaries of everything from basic earth pressure theory through the installation and design of railings and fences on top of the wall. We also have standard drawing or CAD details for all of our different units and applications. Um, a design manual that in detail covers the design methods that Mike had covered earlier in the presentation. And also a construction manual with a detailed construction manual with step-by-step -step installation instructions, design charts, and also specific details for stairways and barriers and fences and that type of thing above the wall. And also a full complete material design and installation specification for each of our different products. Um, to provide assurance of the suitability of the Keystone systems, we've had two high-tech evaluations performed on our Key System 1 and Key System 2. Um, the Key System 1 evaluation covered the use of the key strip steel ladder soil reinforcement and key steel compact units. And the Key System 2 high-tech covered the combination of the compact 2-3 units and mirror 5 mirror grid soil reinforcement. Um, these evaluations were based on AASHTO design specifications. And both systems, through the rigorous evaluation, were find, found to meet the rigid uh, design and construction standards of the specification. So, touch real quick on it. Mike had talked about um, ultimate or short-term connection strength earlier in the presentation. This is an example of the testing we've completed with Mirify um, and the consistency of, of the test data from geogrid strength to geogrid strength. And this is some of the first testing we've um, done for long-term connection strength or to determine the, the long-term creep reduction factor for connection. Um, so to give you an idea of the magnitude of this, the typical creep reduction factor for the geogrid itself is in the 1.45 to 1.6 range. Um, the creep reduction factor for the combination of the Keystone units and the Mirify is at maximum 1.15 and as low as 1.09. Um, this is based on a 1,000-hour test. Earlier I talked about the, the key steel system, or key system one. Um, just to give you an idea of the, the, the strength of this system, um, it has an ultimate connection strength of 18,600 pounds at a half inch of its displacement. Uh, one of the key benefits to this 
connection is it's number one, it's very strong, but it will also yield when severely overthrust. Um, as you can see on the right side, at a deformation of two inches, the system still maintained a connection strength of over 12,000 pounds. To give you an idea of the magnitude of that, our strongest key strip is, um, has a design strength of 9,000, and our lightest one has a design strength of about 3,000 pounds per lineal foot. So effectively, we have a factor safety of connection of 2 to uh, 6 versus the required of 1.5. Now we will have our second poll question. Thanks, Joe. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like your um, answers. What is your experience level with keystone retaining wall systems and segmental retaining walls? Have you specified on a previous project? Are you a wall designer? Are you involved in the construction, observation, and testing? Or do you have no experience with uh, segmental retaining walls? Please go ahead and log your votes. A few questions have come in. Um, so I just wanted to remind everyone we are taking questions throughout the presentation, so please go ahead and log them in the chat box, and we'd be um, happy to get back to you if we don't have enough time to get through all of them. I'll give you a few more seconds to go on the poll. Okay. We have 44% have specified on previous projects, 33% have no experience, 14% of the audience is a wall designer, and uh, nine are in the construction, observation, and testing segment. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Joe. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, now we'll briefly discuss the um, keystone installation steps, shown here in more of a graphical representation. Uh, I won't go into great detail here, but point out a few um, important points. The Probably the, the most important steps are the first two steps. In the placement of the leveling pad, which can be a crushed stone road-based type material, or unreinforced concrete. Um, the levelness and straightness of this leveling pad will determine the levelness of all courses of keystone units above. Okay, after that leveling pad is placed, the first course of units is placed and leveled. Then the pins are installed, additional, and the core fill is placed within the units, compacted, and the reinforced backfill is compacted, and typically eight to 10 inch loose lifts. Uh, additional units are placed, and then a geogrid is placed, and as I mentioned earlier, this is a uniaxial geogrid, so there is a strength direction um, shown in the geogrid orientation box on the second row. Um, after the geogrid is placed over the pins, it's pulled top um, to remove any wrinkles or folds. Um, another course of keystone units is placed on top of it, and the process is repeated to the top of the wall, where the cap unit is placed. Um, the majority of Keystone walls built utilize a half high or four inch uh, keystone cap unit, um, but there are other options to cap the wall, which we'll discuss in the next couple of slides. Okay, now we're going to talk about impact barriers, copings as far as wall um, finishing, and then also discuss drainage and slip joints and utilities. This is a CAD drawing a schematic of a typical Jersey style impact barrier. Okay. And this is the actual installation of that where they're forming the barrier um, above the wall to resist the impact, vehicular impact. And a finished version of that where we have a cast in place barrier. This is more of an architectural look with the, the different reveals and also the ornamental fencing on the top. Other options for capping the wall involve cast in place copings. In this particular drawing. It's what it's called a step coping where you can actually see the top of wall steps versus the next drawing which shows an overhang coping. Um, this provides a much cleaner look at the top of the wall as you don't see the top of wall steps. Uh, generally the coping is two feet thick. Now one very important um, part of the design and construction of the walls is dealing with drainage or water sources whether it be surface runoff infiltration, horizontal groundwater flow, or high water tables, or water at the face of the walls. As long as these conditions are known, are anticipated, and dealt with in the design and construction phase, um, the walls will perform as intended. This is an example of some of the things you can do to uh, control um, and lessen the impact of water on the walls. Number two is the probably the most important basic, um, but it is preventing surface runoff from infiltrating into the wall system. 
through an 8 inch low permeability layer at the top of the wall and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, for groundwater, um, having a horizontal groundwater flow in number three, having a drainage uh, cutoff barrier whether it's a composite or a French drain um, gravel wrapped in a fabric that will intercept the water, bring it down to an outlet pipe through the face of the wall or into a stormwater collection system as determined by local codes. Uh, so at the top of the wall, I'd mentioned um, this is probably one of the most important steps is to prevent the infiltration. The most common way to do that is the bottom of the two pictures where there's an 8-inch low permeability soil layer. Um, in this case, there's a swale. A very important or key uh, element in the design of this feature is that positive drainage is achieved. In other words, the site is greater or above the wall is greater so the water will flow away from the wall or down to the ends of the wall to prevent ponding of water above the wall and eliminate infiltration. Another second option would be to put an impermeable concrete or asphalt bituminous uh, liner. This is typically used only when there's high flow rates expected. Uh, as I mentioned, generally it's the um, soil, vegetated soil layer at the top. Yeah. I'll talk a little bit about um, as you can see, that there's a little settlement going on here. One of the primary benefits of segmental retaining walls is the ability to tolerate um, differential settlement um, or significant total settlements versus rigid structures. Um, even in a case where extreme amounts of settlement are um, anticipated or expected, keystone walls can be designed to uh, accommodate that settlement, as we've done in this particular uh, installation example. The wall section to the right of the cut joint is sitting on a pile cap. Basically, it's a rigid foundation. The wall section to the left of the joint is sitting on a soil foundation. Um, and there was, we anticipated in this particular case there was differential settlement that would occur, and it actually did. There's four inches of settlement, um, but the wall um, didn't undergo any detrimental uh, damage due to that settlement because we designed for it ahead of time. This is another version of a, uh, it's a little fancier version of a, a cut joint. It's a slip joint, and it provides both vertical and horizontal. Um, tolerance of differential settlement. It's a little clearer in this picture. It's basically a stack bond column of compact units and then the wall is brought into it on the left and right side, tucked in behind the wall to give some horizontal overlap and also to allow the different sections of walls to move independently of each other. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about utilities, um, just general details regarding how they, they work with the walls. Um, due to the, the wide use of these walls, we encounter this on a fairly common basis where there are utilities that outlet through the face of the wall. It's a fairly simple approach to dealing with them. Um, if the pipes are less than 24 inches, the units are typically cut to fit around the pipe. Pipes greater than 24 inches, a cast-in-place head wall is used. Okay, we are on to our third poll question. Thanks, Jill. Here we go. What driver is the most influential in choosing your retaining wall type? Aesthetics, ease of design and construction, past experience, or the cost? I'll give you a few more seconds to go ahead and log in your votes. Um, we have seen an uptick in the amount of questions, so that's great. We appreciate that. Um, so we can get to some of these at the end. We have about 10 more minutes of presentation, so we have about five minutes of question and answer at the end. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Uh, we have 43% say cost, 40% say ease of design and construction, 10% say past experience, and 8% say aesthetics. I'll turn it back over to Joe. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, now we're going to talk, um, show what the changes that have occurred over the, the lifespan of Keystone and the, both the products and applications through actual projects. Um, in the early years of segmental retaining walls, or Keystone, a lot of the, the use for these was more in a landscaping application. Um, this is probably the most basic of landscaping, um, but smaller walls. Um, that has changed significantly over time. Uh, actually, in the beginning, um, Paul bit off quite a chunk when he, this was his first project. Um, the wall is about 10,000 square feet, um, and generally these are gravity walls. Um, this was prior to the introduction of GeoGrid Solar. 
In this particular application, it shows how Keystone can be used to create or transform a significant grade separation into a less monolithic structure by using tiered walls and having planting areas to break that up. Uh, it's very aesthetically pleasing rather than a 20 or 25 or 30 foot tall cast in place concrete wall. It's also apparent in this particular photo um, the, how the, the product can blend into the surroundings and create more of a natural stone look. This particular product is our Country Manor multi-piece system. This is an example, um, probably one of our first examples of combining the aesthetic requirements and also significant structural requirements. It's a project in Santee, California. And one of the first projects to utilize our Keystone Random Score unit. Um, those units you're looking at are actually 18 inches wide, but they're appearing to be 18, 7, or 11 inches wide. Um, and also significant color uh, blending was used in this product as well to try to blend into the surrounding um, environment. Another one of the early um, attempts or successes at blending a structural unit um, with aesthetic requirements. In this case, it's a compact hewn um, stone, which once again is a, a molded face um, based on an actual slab of cut rock. Another more current example of blending aesthetics, functionality, um, and severe design circumstances. This is a, a project that utilizes uh, Country Manor. Um, the primary driver for the project was aesthetics, um, and also a system which could be designed to resist the forces um, of a stream environment, which is shown in the next slide, um, the flooding that is underwent. Uh, for safety and aesthetics, um, smaller tiered walls were wanted in this area. It's a, a city park. Um, aesthetics were an extremely important, important um, consideration. As you can see in the upper right-hand corner, um, that was during the flood period. Um, these wall, this, this was anticipated and um, considered in the design of these walls. In the lower center, you can see the actual uh, architectural rendering of, rendering of what this system looked like prior to being constructed. Okay. Um, this is another grade change that initially was conceived as just a, a basic utilitarian reinforced slope. Um, there was a desire to have a more vertical structure, um, but also have areas for plantings. Um, so we took a 30-foot tall slope and turned it into um, a four-terrace wall, which has future areas for planting, as you can see in this photo, uh, with the tiers. Uh, this is an example of a key steel project in Texas. Uh, very tall structure, um, greater than 25 to 30 feet. Uh, combined with a contact multi-plate structure. Um, the keystone key system was used for the wing walls to carry the significant both vertical and impact loads that the wall needed to be designed for. And this shows, this project is, is, a, is a cutting edge project for not only keystone but for segmental retaining walls in general. Um, the project is a little over 100,000 square feet. And the purpose of these walls was to create um, bridge approaches and abutments for exit and on-ramps um, and a major interstate in southeastern Louisiana. The cutting edge portion of this is that these wall or the bridges were actually supported on top of the keystone retaining walls. Um, as you can see in this picture, uh, you can see the bridge foundation sitting directly on top of the keystone wall. Going back to this picture, and then the entire structure was supported, uh, or the entire reinforced mass and bridge was supported on a load transfer platform at the bottom of the wall, which was founded on a deep foundation system. Um, this project utilized both key steel soil reinforcement for the larger four-lane bridges and also Geogrid soil, mirrified geogrid soil reinforcement for the smaller two-lane single span bridges. This is another example of 
innovation of both in design and products. This is a project in Jersey City, New Jersey called Metro Plant. Um, in itself, it doesn't look that unique. It just looks like a, a large wall. Um, the uniqueness of this, as you can see on the left-hand side and about the middle, there is a rock outcropping in there. That rock outcropping continues the full length of the wall at varying uh, slopes. So we need to design the wall uh, with, that, with those rock slopes in mind. In some cases, we're actually placing the wall on a rock slope. Um, in the next slide, I'll show you how we accomplish that. Um, in this particular application, we designed a hybrid wall where we used a rock bolting geogrid connection system to the facing, keystone facing units. Once above the rock elevation where we could get the full length of the geogrid, then a conventional MSE structure was designed and built. Um, and this is a close-up of that particular structure. We're actually using a pipe loop connection to connect the, the soil or the rock bolts to the face of the wall. Another example of the combination of contact systems where we're using Keystone um, Compact 2 Key System 2 wing walls with a multi-plate structure and a cast in place head wall. Um, this particular application, um, the wall is approximately 33 feet tall. And the entire structure is on the order of 37 feet. Um, it was the most efficient and effective um, combinations of systems for the remoteness of it. And this happens to be in Arizona. Um, and also the structural stability required with the steep slopes coming down to the top of the walls. Another very unique project in um, Colorado, this is the Rocky Mountain Airport, and once again this is one of those where there was a desire to combine aesthetic criteria along with structural stability. Um, in this case it's a 55 foot tall retaining structure. And it was a desire of the owner to uh, somehow put the logo of the airport on the face of the wall, and this was accomplished through the use of different color blocks. Um, my understanding that this is supposed to mimic the mountain range um, seen in the background. Another, and this is the final example, um, of the flexibility and structural capacity of the Keystone system. This is the St. Louis Metrolink, obviously in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, it shows the flexibility of the Keystone system and the ability to follow uh, complex curvilinear geometry. Um, in this place, in this particular case, uh, complicating factors were there was a, obviously found on a deep um, foundation system or a pile system, and the geogrid was designed to work in conjunction with those piles, and creating a very successful and in this case probably one of the most or it was the most economical alternative um, to build this wall with um, Keystone, one of the Keystone structural systems. Okay, with that, um, I thank you for your participation in today's webinar, and Lisa will take over from here. Great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, there have been a few questions come up regarding PDH certificates. At the close of the presentation, a new browser window should pop up on your screen with a survey about today's webinar. After you submit the survey, your responses will be manually processed, and you should receive a thank you for attending email within 24 hours with a link of your PDH credit. Again, this process is manual, so it will not be immediately following the webinar. Um, also, we have had questions uh, regarding a copy of the presentation slides. Those will also be available in the link to download in that uh, thank you for attending email. Um, Joe, I do have a few questions that came up throughout the webinar. One of them was, uh, uh, could you give me a good rule of thumb for how far back from the wall, the geogrid should extend? In general, the two different design methodologies that Mike had discussed earlier, the NCMA or National Concrete Masonry Design Methodology, um, suggests the minimum length of the geogrid is 60% of the wall height. The ASHTO criteria is 70% of the wall height or 8 feet. Um, these are both minimums, and depending on back slopes and toe slopes and loading conditions and soil strengths, um, these could increase up to 80 to 100 percent in extreme situations. They could be um, longer than that. 
but those are very detailed uh, designs. So in general, 60 to 70 percent of the wall height is the minimum. Great, thank you. Um, and to go along with that, how tall can the wall system um, be built? And then in addition, with or without the geosynthetic reinforcement? Okay, I'll take the easy one first. Without geosynthetic reinforcement, it's a function of the unit depth. Um, in our particular case with the compact unit where it's 12 inches front to back, that's two and a half to three feet um, is the maximum gravity wall height. The standard unit is four and a half to six feet, depending on the depth of the unit. Um, with regard to a reinforced, um, geogrid reinforced structure or metallically reinforced structure, the theoretical height limit is unlimited. Um, the practical height limit, um, based on our experience, is somewhere in the 50 to 60 foot range for a single wall. And once exceeding that, depending on the foundation strengths and so on, um, tiered walls are typically used where there's a three to four foot setback from tier to tier. Um, there have been walls built in that configuration up to 100 feet in height. Great. Thank you. Um, and then I have another one. Can these walls be built along streams? Um, and if so, is there a specific design software for that? The walls can be built along streams, and it's not so much in the design. It's more of the detailing of the wall that's um, of import or of concern um, with regard to building, providing erosion protection at the toe of the wall. That could mean um, riprap or deeper embedment than typical. Um, potentially using a concrete leveling pad versus a stone leveling pad from an erosion protection standpoint. And then also using a free draining granular uh, backfill. And in conjunction with that, using filter fabrics to prevent uh, as separators between the, the granular coarse material and any finer grained retained or foundation soils um, are key points there. Uh, generally, the Clean stone granular material would be used to a height of at least one to two feet above the high water line. Um, with regard to specific design software, um, one consideration when designing in water applications um, is to consider rapid drawdown. In other words, as the water level changes or goes down quickly, um, that in most cases needs to be or should be considered in the design unless you have a, a backfill that is so free draining that it will not create an imbalance of forces from the inside of the wall to the outside as the water level drops. Great. That was a really good explanation. Thank you. Um, I have another one regarding the software. How can we get um, an engineer get a copy of the design software and also a short lesson on how to use the software? Okay. The Keystone Keywall design software is available on our tech CD, which you can request on our website at keystonewalls.com. Um, along the, the bottom of the web page is a banner bar where you can select a tech, Keystone tech CD or technical CD, which has the uh, software on it, along with all the CAD details and specifications, and also the design um, parameters or information to be used in other design softwares is with regard to connection strengths and geogrid strengths and things like that. Um, as far as uh, a tutorial, that can be requested. Um, and we have local representatives throughout the country that could um, do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, training session on the QL design software, whether it be online or in person. Great. Thank you. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, in respect of your time, we have come to the top of the hour. So we're going to go ahead and end the webinar. But if you have any questions or if you have not received your email within 24 hours, please contact Keystone at KeystoneWalls.com. And again, we thank you for your time and hope you learned something new from our webinar today. Have a great rest of your day.